Thank you for joining. I'm really excited to get to talk to everybody today. So let's get into it. I'm Matt Tillman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Open Envoy. And I'm joined here today by Gabor Svintabani, the CIO of Chimera International. Thank you, Gabor, for joining us. We appreciate your time. Matt, thank you very much for having me. Um, just quickly, for those of you who don't know, Open Envoy capture codes matches complex spend using AI. Um, and we're really, really efficient with it, very focused at AP and AR solutions. Um, and uh, and we're here, what we're really here today to talk about is is Gabber and Chimera International and your journey in uh, AI adoption. So would you tell us a little bit about Chimera International to start? I'm very happy to. Chimera International is a specialty material manufacturing company, usually first couple of places in the overall supply chain, we provide specific materials for specific use cases in diverse end markets. Primarily, it is automobile, aerospace, uh, DOD, and, and other applications. Uh, the company is currently in a very rapid growth phase through m and primarily. And I'm very happy to be part of this organization because that's the best moment to be there. We build a lot, we create a lot. It is a 150-year-old company. I am the first CIO of the company, which is giving me the possibility to, to build some exciting and new IT solutions, but also to build up with other departments and, and build together, team up and, and deliver something which is more than just one or the other could do alone. And this is where I think our subject or use case is coming into, uh, into the discussion that with Open Envoy, we are working on automating account pay and also the AP activities. But even more, we try to improve organizational maturity, which is, I think, even if not more important than, than automating this and that elevating the company. And this is where IT and finance can and actually has to or have to uh, act. Especially with eight acquisitions a year. I mean, that's that's pretty serious, right? Or four four acquisitions, I think, is what your target is for the rest of this year, something like that. So we target having one acquisition a quarter. It depends on the size, of course, of the acquisition. I'm very proud and happy that today we just announced one. And it is fantastic that uh, uh, how great companies can be integrated rapidly into, into one organization and leverage the overall capability. So um, yes, one a quarter is what we can. It means the closed deals. Obviously, there are additional work in the background for future deals, also deals which unfortunately cannot happen for whatever reason. I cannot spend or speak more about m and of course, because that's an important uh, secret subject uh, at Chimera, but we're very proud of our documented and, and five results. Yeah, congratulations then. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, CFOs and CIOs sort of have to work together now. Uh, in December last year, I believe it was, Gartner released a report that effectively said boards and C-suites expect to increase cost savings by about 15% by mid-2025. And if you think about that in terms of like enterprise spend, that is a massive number that they expect to gain with the use of AI. And in a relatively short time frame, I mean, typical projects, like it, just in the AP automation space, like our competition, the, the space generally has about a nine-month implementation cycle. And uh, we obviously don't, don't worry, but uh, with the space itself, like just to get incremental value in nine to 12 months has been a challenge historically, let alone exponential value. So it's a lot of pressure that's being placed on, on executives like yourself and executives like your CFO as well. Um, do you have a comment on that? Happy to hear uh, it. No, no, that's cool. uh, I, I would love to comment on the AI, but uh, let's do it a bit, a bit later. <laughs> Not not necessarily the fear that one of these reports by Gartner sort of generates um, amongst uh, amongst teams. Um, a modern what this really means is that a modern approach to buying software needs to be implemented. So the legacy approach of incremental solutions um, just doesn't work in order to hit those types of numbers and those types of time frames. Um, and then you're finding a lot of like solutions that were they AI, AI first. Is it a bolt-on? Does it matter? Is it incremental change? Is it potentially exponential change? It's sort of how to evaluate that. We're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to get into that pretty deeply in a few minutes. And then the other thing that you realize is AP and AR are sort of classically cash management controller functions have been mostly in incremental games with previous 
products. And we're going to talk a lot about your, your opinions on RPA and sort of the migration away from that over time. But these legacy solutions that are out there that are still in market, that are still selling in market, sort of create change management challenges and offer incremental solutions. And so that's really difficult to navigate around and how do you do that? And we're going to talk a little bit about your buying process and how you did that successfully at, at Chimera. Um, and then ultimately, you got to take control of this type of thing before it hits an audit. Last thing you want is an AI solution to come in or any exponential solution, which is usually very uh, well aligned with high growth companies like yours. But you don't, you don't want to hit an audit at the end of the year and find out that you've done the wrong thing, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about how you guys think about controls and, and controlling things. So let's get into the meat of it, which is you've come into a new company. You're the first CIO at the time. This is a little while back. Partner with the CFO. What was that initial conversation about just in terms of you know his needs and, and what he was looking for in the company and what he was looking to improve upon and then how, how you thought about delivering that? Uh, so the most important point here is CFO and the office of the CFO is, is client number one for IT. CFO and finance is in charge and in control of the numbers. Those numbers which are delivered to the vehicle of IT. And this is where we need to get, get as well connected as possible. I had the pleasure to work with, uh, for companies where CFOs and CIOs were detached, where they were very well integrated and connected. As a practice, I can say that the connected work is, is adding much more result. Siloed activities are not really helping. It's one company. It is our company. So working together adds tremendous value. Involving IT soon or let IT start an initiative and jumping in as a finance support is usually the best way to, to, to make things happen. Um, obviously, life is not black or white at this case. It is usually one of the great skills we have. We, are, we can state, I think, clearly that both the office of the CFO and the CIO are extremely overloaded. We have thousands of things to do in like no time. So efficiency is something which is very, very important. You mentioned RPA um, and AI. I, I had the pleasure to get more feedback in, in RPA, spent three years from my life uh, really deep diving in RPA and RPA in several, actually more than 100 use cases. Then I turned it to AI and I welcomed the new way of doing things, which is making it much more future-proof, I would use this term, uh, every activity we are automating. I would like, I don't know the, the level of, of experience of the audience. So let me start making something very clear. AI is a big buzzword. And people see either open AI behind as a, as a unique participant or, or something untouchable, very complex, and it does funky things. Um, I think it is important to mention here that there is no need for the old school. Let's install a server, buy some application software, et cetera, get some engineers, lock them into the room, and only feed them with pieces as long as they are ready. It is not what we, we have to do here. This is, I think, what took both finance and IT's attention in open and was offering that it comes with a mouse hunt. So we do not really have to transpire hard to get this AI capability. Instead, it is built into the product, so it is applied AI, applied AI, applied by you guys at Open Envoy. So we get it as a part of our subscription. And there is no need to build complex or, or, or difficult solutions around it. Unlike RPA, where you do need to set up your, your system, at least two to three servers, schedulers, et cetera, you have to put in. And as you can see it on the screen, there's an invoice with lots of numbers on it. In a good RPA word, you specify that on the first line, on the right side of the screen, you have a number, this is most likely the invoice number, it must be the invoice number. If it is changing for whatever reason, the whole IP, RPA activity fails and starts taking either the due amount or, or, or something else as an interpreted information. AI is different here. AI understands the invoice, understands that it is a harsh word, there is obvious the technical detail, a very difficult technical detail in, in the background, but that's the beauty of it, we don't have to know this. AI and you mentioned, you mentioned that actually earlier, just to interrupt for a real second, the, you mentioned earlier the fact that the AP team, the, the CFO, the office of the CFO, they've got a lot of other work going on. 
So you're adding like evaluation to that work and then you're adding change management to your point on the RPI side or, or any other workflow solutions. They're all sort of similar in that way is that you add a lot of change management. Your team has to change. Your suppliers have to change in order to make it work. And it's sort of untenable if you've got a high growth company that needs to add new companies on a regular basis. It just doesn't make sense to scale headcount linearly with growth. You want to obviously see headcount sort of remain flat and revenue increase and gross margins increase with, with flat headcount. And so the CFO has to deal with all this and identifying you know, new products to use. And so how did that process happen? Because it was kind of interesting at Chimera where we got to know you after the CFO. Normally, uh, CFOs try to buy our software and then jam it down IT's throat at the very last minute, which is a very frustrating thing for us being highly technical people. We'd rather just sort of have that conversation early. But but I think with with you guys, you handled it, the approach differently. Did you, you already had solutions that you'd worked with, correct? Actually, almost. Uh... The VP of Finance and, and 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 I teamed up and started to look for the first and I think the the real low hanging fruit of automation, which is API automation. Both of us had very successful API automation in in our past. We have seen different solutions operating. One or the other had a very clear understanding. This is what I want to see at Chimera. Obviously, we wanted to to refresh our view and and understanding, so we brought in. Gartner to, to have an overview of the market. And after a couple of Gartner discussions and internal reviews, um, we ended up saying what we have seen and did was great at that time. But actually now it is, time is changing fast and, and processes are changing fast. Most importantly, solutions are changing fast. We could do better than, than, than we did in the past. And, and, and this is where we selected the, the, your solution and uh, with big hopes because you're right on that point. First of all, we don't have time. And second, we are unable to control our suppliers. We are a small company in that sense. So we are unable to make pressure on the market to invoice me on the way I want. You're getting all the invoices you can think about. Hopefully email-based, but sometimes we even have to scan them to, to push them over to, to open envoy. And this is the point where both the CFO office and, and, and the IT team said that we need to find a solution which is we work on it once it starts working and we forget we have other priorities to deal with at this point implementing it for a company for 2 to 10 to 15 irrelevant is the same implementation what we have to do is ensure that we're internal and this is where the change management comes in or internal processes are ready for this and this is where organizational maturity comes in. I'm sure you all have seen that an invoice is coming in so quickly you try to smuggle a PO behind it so it looks like you did the job properly. Um, this is not different, I think, in any other companies. Maybe some very major and Fortune 500 companies do it properly. Everyone else is trying to fake it, I guess. Um, apologies for them from those who are doing it right. Uh, if you really wanted to, to do this change and Talking to finance now, we're just talking to finance a year ago. It's a very different discussion we have. Now we see how, how we are actually automating things. Uh, now we are expecting results from solutions. We want to see how POs are coming in. We, with open and void, we have the possibility to measure how good we are doing on our front yard, let's say. Uh, and AP team will flag that Gabor and his department are not very good at doing POs in advance. So I'm sure that at that moment, I'm going to be invited to a meeting asking Gabor, could you just do better, please? Because numbers are proving. And, and, and being part of the measure community is good because that keeps everyone, wouldn't say keep up the toes, but doing the right thing. So the organization is moving to a higher level on altogether. This is, I think, the biggest impact that IT leader can, can, can think about contributing in maturing the organization. And I think it. you had, you actually came to a, a, a decision in terms of the KPI you were trying to influence, I believe as well, right? At Chimera, you and the CFO said, can we generate 3% or so? You had a number of EBITDA just by the use of AI in a short period of time. And can you talk to me about like, how do you, how did you arrive at that number? How did you arrive at that sort of metric? Was that, was that a metric that you wanted to hit day one or did that evolve throughout the process? 
I wouldn't say it's a KPI, it's more of a target. Uh, we, obviously, with every project we started to, to understand what is the organizational impact and why should we do this project? I mean, does it make sense for the company to, to do the project? What is the value it adds? And, and at that point, the first of, of obvious idea is I'm going to save a bunch of AP clerks because I'm automating the process, so I'm saving a couple of heads, which is wrong. I mean, you might save a couple of heads if you want to, but I would instantly repurpose. And let's let us let's see and study where, where applied AI can help and where automation can help. I put together a little cheat sheet for myself, so forgive me moving my eyes a little bit. I just don't want to miss any opportunity here. Listing all the, all the items where an immature company is unable to, to, to score versus a mature process can, can deliver clear value, organizational value, is, is, is through diverse areas. First of all, it depends on how your checks and balances are sorted in the company. You mentioned audit. Audit and corporate audit or year-end audit is the last grouping. Everything else during the year, if you have a healthy and, and, and well-working checks and balances system, during the months you capture things which are not done right for whatever reason. And, and with AP, you can book things on a very awkward way if something is not, not, not correct. So you might want to save your time during the months, not figuring it out by the end of the months or the end of the quarter or the end of the year or after the end of the year where all these figures are done for you. And this is the point where those companies which are accumulating a, a mountain of three, four, five hundred inefficiencies in an audit, which they have to somehow sort in two months' time, that means the whole finance team plus a bunch of external supporters and, 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 and external contractors try to dig those numbers out, figure what happened to those papers, which are somewhere in the bottom of a, uh, of a drawer. Um, that is not an efficient way of doing it. So definitely there is a clear opportunity to save because there is something which we usually not speak about, the side effect of automation. Especially in the financial area, IT people somewhat understand it, even if it is not mentioned, because we have the detail, technological detail in the background. All the unstructured and chaotic information which we throw on open is actually getting structured and leveled. Um, Matt, we had a call long after we signed, and you mentioned this to me that, by the way, that's your data and you get it back if you want it to. So hold on, are you feeding it back to my data warehouse? If you want to, for free. And that's the point which I didn't understand as a go-to-market strategy, because we get it back labeled, structured for free. That is an opportunity. I mean, think about your, your procurement. You have all the year of spending, Structured, labeled, searchable, available, a couple of months. That's a gold mine. Yeah. Yeah, actually, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, we don't normally think about that as a big selling point, or we didn't used to. And uh, because our attitude was like, well, you, we're not going to steal your data, <laughs> you know, so we can't use it for anything else, right, except for training models. And so, so yeah, it's yours and you, you can have it back. And, and um, you actually mentioned that. If we could dial back to just one thing before we get into this too much, which is with, with the other solutions that you were used to in the market, it requires a ton of configuration, a ton of work in-house, and then you structure a very limited amount of data that's actually usable by the rest of the organization, which ties into what you're talking about right now, which is is if you could get if if you do the the actual job, the actual work of auditing something end to end before you get stung at the end of the year then you end up with all these other data sets, which can impact the rest of the organization, right? Which can make a massive improvement. To your point on procurement, right? Um, uh, procurement's one area, risk and compliance is another area. Just pricing and packaging, positioning, the actual business is another area, right? Potentially depending on what you're talking about in the material components. And so it should impact everything. Was there a, so that was obviously the big point for you. The big moment for you was like, well, wait a second, all this data is now perfectly structured and I can use it, right? How did the rest of the organization react to that? Like, how, how does the rest of the organization started thinking about things differently because of because of the impact this has made? We are not quite there yet. Uh, I clearly have plans for this. I'm seeing uh, the bucket of flowers delivered by procurement for sure uh, to most IT and and net finance on this. I also hope that we it gives us the possibility to better structure what we are doing. 
Think about the integrations. When you buy a company, you literally walk into a house with the lights off. So you don't know what you have. You, you know high level, but, but you don't know the details. Feeding those invoices through open envoy, we get a, an understanding, a, a high level structure that, hey, this is what is happening. By the way, these are the duplicated invoices, so you don't want to keep on paying them any further. Those are the, let's say, fraudulent invoices. We all know that impersonation or CEO impersonation scam where someone injects an, an unknown invoice to the, to the company and urge people to pay it rapidly. All these are filtered out here. All these are immediately split by the system and saying, hey, I don't know what this is. You want to give it over. This is giving us the control. And, and I think it's very important. I don't know how many of you audience have worked in AP. I had the pleasure in very early on my career to spend a little time in AP. It's fantastic. You get a pile of invoices and you have to go through every single day, not knowing why they are there. You're not knowing what they are. If you're lucky, you understand the language of it. But you can't really have, we don't really have anything to tie this to. You need to process the invoice. And certain times, it is the clerical AP position, which is the only filter point and protection point between doing the right thing or, or falling into a trap. This is going away immediately. And, and to me, this alone has a tremendous value. So adding all these together, the saving in audit time, audit fees, actually, the third party the fees, repurposing AP people instead of doing the, the very mechanical work, focusing on doing value-added work, like advising departments to do it maybe a little better, work on other, other areas of finance, work on the new acquisitions instead of existing companies, because the existing companies free-flowing through the system, these are the opportunities where, where, where we can accumulate the real return of the investment. Yeah. And again, AI is making it future-proof. I think we should spend a little word about also the implementation, because I was surprised by that point a little bit as well. And it, I'm not here to make advertisement for you guys. I'm here to talk to you. Uh, but that was a good point that instead of pulling in a third party who starts with a fat invoice and then takes three weeks of, or three months of time of my team and then leaves with the know-how, you guys are working with us and implement it. And we didn't really have to sacrifice too much resource from Chimera to to make it happen. We were slow. I, I, I give the point because we made a couple of acquisitions in between and that had priority. But at the same time, it was clearly an open and we and Chimera IT and Chimera Finance corporations. AP team had a lot to do. Obviously, we also made their area. Um, finance primarily was focused on the AP area. IT, due to Department of Defense, we have a very important cybersecurity requirement. So we had to, to check all the these cross and I dots the, dotted in, in the connection in the single sign-on area. The whole connectivity is, is, is taking all the boxes because we want to, to respect the Department of Defense's requirements and even more. Um, that hasn't delayed the project, but took some time to, to get ready to do it. And afterwards, it was more discussions how the project develops and evolves. So the reason we are the biggest amount of time was lost, I think, on financial closing because the AP team had time to work on the project in between closings. Well, you can't mess up. You can't mess up security when you're a DoD contractor. That's not how that works. And so we had to we had to focus on that and be, you know, when we look at the market generally, and you look at the other solutions in the market. One of the things that frust always frustrated me as a buyer when I was on your side of the the fence was that I spent. Basically, I bought the software, configured the software, trained my team to use the software. This took like, let's say it took six months or something like that. Usually with the ERP style tools, it takes about six months to nine months. And then it, and for the following three months after that, I had to beg my largest suppliers in order for all of my previous investment to work. And so you had to do change management with your team, change management with your IT team, change management with your suppliers. And so that's why you see supplier um, adoption so low across the industry. I think it's like, I've heard numbers from like one of our customers was at 7%. They're a $70 billion company. They're at 7% supplier adoption. So they sort of have the most leverage possible and still their suppliers won't, won't give them the time of day. I think that's a very, 
obvious problem in the space. And the second one was that nine months, you're paying a third-party consulting firm in reality to do that implementation because it's not like you're going to staff a bunch of engineers in-house like you were talking about and buy, you know, off-the-shelf product and try to build this yourself with some sort of general sort of AI tool or general RPA tool or whatever the general tool sets are just is sort of unreasonable. And so we look at it and we think internally, how fast can we get to straight through processing? How fast can we get to time to value for you as the customer? And plenty happy to jump through, obviously, security hoops, things like that for, for our customers. Um, but since you mentioned security, it's not just about connectivity with on-prem services and things like that. It's actually about like, where does your data go? Who are the third parties? And what I find is most companies don't list their sub-processors publicly. So your data is just being, you know, sent around there. You might find it in other countries. And that's just not acceptable for a firm like yours. Is that something that was a real concern early on and then became less of one as you got to know us? Or how did you think about solving those sort of security questions, just in terms of data leakage, data ownership? Actually, tremendously. So uh, I'm actually paid on an everyday basis to be paranoid. Uh, in some part of my job, some part of my job, I have to, I have to stay very optimistic. Security is the area where we really have to action the worst. And cybersecurity, one part is DOD requirements. Obviously, keep the secret secret, but also have an operation which is stable enough to secure the, the future cooperation as well. This is why I, where I say IT is securing the today, but also the tomorrow, and they have the future for it. This is the area where we need to think about sending more data somewhere in a secure way is fantastic. As you just say, if it is processed locally, on the other end, at open envoy, that's fantastic. This is where AI solutions have a trend that some companies are sending it forward to an AI engine, which is actually learning from the data. It is not going to be published on New York Times first page, but it is going to sit somewhere out there. And others may be inadvertently get some information out. You don't want to have that, especially not with something which is important and the secretive information of the company. So thinking about what the whole data flow is and, and where your data is sitting right now in this moment and where it can go, who can access to it, is, is a question you have to ask. You have to ask and actually you have to audit every once in a while to ensure that you keep control of all of your data. And when you think about um, so there's the audit on the security, just like where, what's happening with your data. How is it leaky? Is it leaking? You know, that sort of thing. There's there's a ton of concern around that, obviously. And then on the other side, you know, what we always find is like visibility within an AP department is really important. So one of the things I know that you mentioned was the controller was actually a part of the process as well, and uh, which was great to hear and actually said, and I believe on the Gartner calls or or at least was part of that process as well, which is important. Controllers often with these sorts of solutions are sort of uh, two things. One, they're sort of like really excited about the efficiency if they see high growth coming. And obviously with you guys as an acquisition-based organization, they see high growth coming. They see headaches coming, right? They see new invoices with new languages and new countries that are hard to process and keep compliant. So they see that coming. Some controllers are not in high growth companies. So I have a natural fear of this, like, what's this going to do with my job? Is this going to take away my job? Like, what does this look like, right? There's always a concern. You guys didn't handle that in a really uh, smart way, which is we've got a ton of growth coming. The job's only going to get bigger and we're not going to start, you know, hiring more headcount, right, in order to, to satisfy that requirement. But also we need to make sure that the invoices come in on time, that they're being processed quickly because you don't want to hit credit checks. You know, you want all these sorts of things to keep working. When you think about the controller's adoption of this and how they're thinking about it now, has their thought process changed? Because we're talking about the CFO and the CIO sort of making the decision, but the controller obviously is very impacted by this. Has their thought process changed on how this sort of thing is going to work? I think generally speaking, there is no real risk of losing the job. AP is a small part of a controller's job. It's a very important part, of course, to, to ensure that money is going out in a proper order and, and structure. But it is just one part of the job. Um, I used to say that those who fear the job from AI are approaching it wrong. AI is not doing your job. I wish it would be possible. Uh, I have a whole 
bloom to that moon, right? But it's not happening, unfortunately. I have to do it, and and this is valid for all the or most of the 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 IT or or, or finance jobs as well. AI is an aid to help. So the process itself is important. You need to 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 look at your processes, and I suggest try to see how AI can help you to do certain parts of the process better and faster. Don't try to expect a much faster execution of the same process. See how you can leverage AI into your human and AI relationship. And that liaison is adding value to your process. This is where I feel that you might avoid hiring additional resources as, as you grow, as you do more, especially with a, with a high-paced uh, m and environment. But I'm not seeing that we're going to let anyone go just because we have AI. Right. AI is, is, is helping us be more mature, doing more, being more structured, and that more structured activity requires a little different execution. So there is a place for AI and there's a place for human as well. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, we were talking about, I think the the value that you get out of the process and how efficient how efficient you can make the process, and right, and where that 80-20 rule sort of plays a big, a big role. Um is that still the case for you? Are you seeing um, new sorts of KPIs that you can measure against new sorts of, like, how do you think about measuring this once now it's implemented? So going forward, you're looking out of the of course of the next couple of years. How do you think about measuring this, keep it, continuing to measure this, and then sort of reusing a lot of the the secondary effects, such as the data and things like that, which we talked about for, for procurement, but sort of how do you think about measuring it over time? Is it Overbilling, savings, duplicates, which are obviously very big, um, operational efficiency, saving money on audits. Like, what's the thing that you and the CFO are constantly looking at saying, you know what, that's that's actually going to make a bigger impact than we expected, or if we tweaked it, it would make a really big impact here. How do you think about measuring it in the go forward, not just the prioritization up front in the project? So to me, it is it is somewhat timed approach. Right after the implementation, six months later and then the second year. And the second year is, to me, the critical one. This is where I want to see all those returns. This is where I want to see the famous 3% we spoke about or targeted, because this is where I feel that overbilling, fraudulent payments, duplicated invoicing, audit time decrease and audit time and audit fees, it will be hard to estimate, but from past years, you can you can have a good, good guess, I think. Um, automated. AP on the overall organizational efficiency. If you think about doing POs after the effect versus doing the PO when you start in the negotiation phase and just sign the contract timing, that PO sits in your ERP system. You can actually carry the POs. You can actually get an understanding what engagements you made for your company. So in, immediately you can, you can have a better understanding where you're going to land in six months from nine months from that, a little bit of a forecasting tweak as an opportunity. Um, repurpose some of the AP resources. I want to see that AP people have a, an easier life, a less monotone, more structured, and better supported aided life, so they can do more than just heads down, dig through the big pile of invoices. And last but not least, we mentioned uh, procurement. The structured data we are able to feed back to procurement. The procurement can, can make better and faster decisions. This is, I think, the most important thing. Procurement gets that information somewhere three months down the road. Here, actually, procurement can get the information if they want it to next day, next week. So depends on what we are looking at and, and, and how we are able to team up first the CFO, afterwards with procurement and, and, the, and the other business units. Or, or, or functions, that gives us possibility to see how good we do. AP has everything what the company has purchased to do business. That is giving a special perspective, but a full perspective of how the company is operating, automating it, and make, put, giving it back as a, as a data set, which is searchable gives transparency to your organization, which is to me fantastic. Yeah, it is It is sort of funny. Uh, a couple of our customers had commented early on, you know, every other solution in the market basically says, 
Um, the solution works perfectly and it's straight through processing so long as you have perfect POs for every single one of your purchases. And it's sort of a ridiculous concept to your point is like you sort of everybody, every company in the world, maybe 65% PO in reality. Everybody says, oh no, we have POs that cover everything. And it's like, all right, let's see how that actually works in practice. But the truth is you definitely have a contract, which is your legally binding agreement. And it may or may not be represented well in the PO in the first place, because it turns out humans take your contracts and then they put them into a PO. They generate a PO in your ERP. And then hopefully that PO stays up to date over time as you get contractual amendments that occur, or tier-based pricing or whatever it is, you get maybe early pay discounts. And the thing is, one of the th things that we find that's across the board for every customer is that the contracts and the purchase orders, there's a disparity. And it's because of the way purchase orders are set up. If you know ERPs really well, like they have like a, a, a lot of fields that they require for the process of uh, AP later on. Um, but there's a descriptive field in every single ERP and everybody just jams like basically contract terms in the descriptive field. And then you have a natural language problem. So now you're asking your AP team who doesn't understand why you bought the thing and hasn't seen the contract to look at a purchase order if one exists, to beg for someone to create a purchase order quickly so they can pay the bill before the payment deadline. And sort of, sort of this irrational process. So we looked at it and we just said, what if purchase orders didn't exist? What if there was a contract that exists, which is a legal thing that, that everybody's going to have or a quote or a bid that was accepted, even if it's over email or something, and then match the invoice against that or match even the receivables against contracts if it's outgoing on the other side. And then match and then reconcile the purchase order against those and make sure that they're all correct. So you get like instantaneous verification of your operational process at the same time that you're getting spend analytics, right? So you don't have a long wait time to, to get to spend analytics. You don't have to go around creating a lot of purchase orders. In fact, what you can do is just throw everything into the system and the system will relate those to the correct contractual term that was agreed upon by the customer and the and by our customer. And what that does is to your point, it gives you real time procurement data. You no longer have to wait for procurement data. In fact, most of our customers are live within invoice processing within like the first week, not, not the full matching because if there's specialized rules and things like that and third party APIs that we do and things like that. But but the but the actual digitization can be done very quickly, which does give you that spend analytics to your procurement team. They probably have never had before in reality because they're waiting for like BI tools to get it from the ERP and make sure that it wasn't, you know, fat fingered and not to blame users, but users are usually the people that create the, the challenges, right? And so, um, so I think your point's absolutely valid that if your AP and AR aren't impacting your business, then that's a system problem in reality. And you have to have better tools in place so they can make a bigger impact on procurement, sales, at P&A, to your point earlier, right? Any of these guys. And this is a good point you mentioned because the future-proofing part is extremely important. Um, what you mentioned for us is it, it, it is, is, is far down the road. We do want purchase orders at the moment. But as we evolve and nature in a good moment, we might want to say, why would we waste our time? If, and AI can, there is a fully supported closed system, which is able to perfectly match. And this is the proof of the pudding. If you're able to show you in the first year how great it functions, people still trust in it. In it. And therefore, it can really leverage the, that value we wanted to see out of the whole solution we are able to get to that point, what you just mentioned, that show the contract and it has been signed by someone who's having the signature right. So there is an approval of it. There is, why would we approve the invoice again, the bill, the invoice, and then the payment? All those cycles can be saved. Added to that overall saving, that's 3% is maybe even longer than it. Yeah, we actually find, I think the average that we find is 4% 4, 4 of total spend can be blocked um, after we were implemented with our customer. It's usually around 4%. And that's because duplicate billings, just no ERP handles duplicates properly. Um, over billings are very hard to find unless you can do, you know, it's sort of ridiculous to say to an AP person, I expect you to have working knowledge in memory of every single line item that you've ever paid historically. It's sort of like this impractical thing. So technology is very good at that, at that type of problem. Um, we've got a couple of, questions from the audience. But before we get there, 
Uh, we'll do uh, uh, 10 minutes or so of Q&A. So if you guys have extra questions, feel free to add them to the Q&A bar. I'm looking at that. Um, I just wanted to summarize a couple of things that we talked about. Um, and I think you would agree with this is like, first of all, when applying AI to your organization, pick a use case, like focus on delivering business value with a use case. Don't just buy some like generic tool and then spend your time configuring it, et cetera. But pick a use case. You guys picked AP. There's also AR, there's cash uh, management. There's a number of solutions that one can pick. Um, you talked about eliminating control risk, which is super important. Data privacy, obviously for your business, especially critical. Um, you just don't get to you don't get to make a mistake there, right? This is not like a tech firm, which, you know, leaks customer information or something like that, that you hear, read about all the time. This is like a DOD contractor. So you have to be very serious about it. And then leverage your existing infrastructure. I know you already had BI tools. We don't need to become your next BI tool. Providing you BI data is really, your data uh, BI tool with data is very important. I believe, which BI tool are you guys on? Uh, we are a Microsoft shop. So we are using Google BI and we have a, a data warehouse, which is, Simulating all the data or data lakes, so we um, where we feed all the data in and report on what we find important. So I'm seeing a very rich uh, AP information appearing very soon in that. Okay. Great. So this is sort of the the quick checklist on how you should think about applying AI to your organization. It's like make sure it does a thing and delivers value. Um, I know Gavin and I were both technologists by trade. I would buy all sorts of infrastructure projects and monkey around with them for days and days and days if you let me. But the reality is you got to get the work done and you've got to get value live as fast as possible so that your business is, you know, uh, one of the things we always say, and I think this is said more broadly about AI is it, it generates exponential changes. And if you're generating exponential changes, your competitors aren't. And if your competitors aren't, they they can't catch up. They will never catch up to you if you continue to create exponential returns. It's very very important to think about. Um, so with that, I've got some I've got some questions uh, that have come up. Um, so we've talked a couple about about a couple of these, which has been great. When you think about, you have a very you shared with it at the Gartner conference, which was great. You have a very thoughtful approach to integrating acquisitions. So you actually leave, if I, if I have this right, you leave the operating companies in charge of their ERP and then your connectivity aggregates everything. So your company has a centralized reporting structure. Can you take us through how that works in practice, how you're looking at that for the, for the next item, for the most recent acquisition, in fact, and how do you think about that going forward? So ERP stands for enterprise resource planning. It doesn't, it is not built for reporting. A lot of, leaders, business leaders, use ERPs for reporting. It has to automate what we're doing. So when we're buying companies, the first thing we do from IT, we start understanding how they operate. Are they happy with their, their ERP support? Are they processes automated with ERP? We're not checking the processes if they are good or bad, but checking if the processes, existing processes are properly automated. Usually buying a company after the day of the close, there is just one ask from senior leadership, business as usual, please keep on doing what we do. We want to ensure you issue your products and your bills out and your customers are keep on ordering and, and, and you keep on producing. This is what we want to ensure we are securing. An ERP project, regardless of the size, is impactful, is, is disruptive, is, is difficult, takes a lot of time. We don't want to do that. Instead, we want to leave our acquisitions with their ERP. If they are delivering what an ERP should deliver for a company, proper information, automation, we connect that to our data warehouse, reports through that. That way we are able to, instead of trying to refix the ERP implementation of the acquired company, we can focus on another company acquisition. This accelerates or, or grows, makes life easier, and most importantly, less disruptive. Yeah, and that is a really unique take. Most times, acquire a company, especially larger companies like like you're looking at, acquire a company, hire a PS team, get the PS team to like, you know, professional services team to go in and and maybe even a solution, a systems integrator to go in and actually fully integrate, basically just bill you to merge databases effectively. And it takes a really long time. It's highly disruptive, creates a lot of change management. And so by adopting tools that don't require that change management, I think you've done a 
you know, obviously you, you haven't do no harm, I think, right. Is how you think about it, which is like, first keep them making money, keep them generating revenue. Right. And let us be efficient. ERP and, and, and changing the core of, of a business is very disruptive, very costly. Instead, we have a great partnership with, 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 with our third parties. We connect and just enjoy being together. Yeah. Um, you guys have some pretty complex invoices. Uh, and we are partnering with you on that that complexity. What's your take on the partnership? How has the partnership actually worked for you and, and your opinions on the partnership? Because we're going through and we're, we're implementing some pretty complex sort of processes, procedures, workflows, and things like that that you guys have had historically and just want to make sure that we do no harm, of course. So how do you think about the partnership and how do you see the partnership developing long-term, I guess, is the, the question. I will have some disappointing news for you. I don't know nothing about this, which means it never that uh, escalated to, to that level that we have to speak about it. I know that when I did RPA, there was a big fight around someone changed it and someone changed that. Here, it is just happening. And, and I'm sure that the, uh, the AP team at Chimera is doing a very massive and, and, and important job here to, to keep it running and operational. I don't know any of the items which, which have been ever escalated. We have weekly and monthly calls on, on this topic. It never surfaced. So I can't really tell you anything about it because it is just happening as it seems. So, you're, so uh, if you go with Open Envoy, your CIO won't get yelled at on a regular basis. That's actually the takeaway there, which is, is lovely. I mean, I've definitely, uh, you know, I started my, on my career in uh, ERP implementations, actually, and uh, and I'll go trading off of that. And uh and it was it was just sort of this nightmare, these big complex integrations. I think most people are conditioned for enterprise software to just be these sort of nightmare nine, 12, 18 month slogs. Okay. And the fact that you get to value very quickly, especially, you know, I think after security checks and things like that, I think it was only like a month, month in, right? That we had to go through all that stuff. So after that, it gets the pace um, picks up pretty aggressively. And uh, we always did this thing uh, originally early on, customers would say, which uh, systems integrators do you work with? And and we sort of like tongue in cheek say, we're going to charge you double if you introduce a systems integrator. Um, we'd rather just, we'll just do it ourselves. We'll help be held accountable to it. And uh, and people are always taken aback by the fact that there was no professional services or something like that attached to it. It was really about getting you up to speed, time to value as fast as possible. Um, and then partnership wise, I think, you know, we obviously, you guys are acquiring new companies, but there'll be more systems to integrate with and connect to and things like that. But um, from a partnership standpoint, you guys have, have been great. So that's just uh, my my take. Uh, and it also hasn't been escalated to me either. So so I think we're both doing a good job there. Um, it, it's also important that it's also important that we have a great finance team. So kudos to them actually, because they do the, the important like work. Uh, it is their process. They own the process. We help them. Uh, making it better and, and, and efficient, but they own the process and they actually really own it. So kudos to them. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to uh, working with customers. You can tell immediately who has a very serious finance team and, and serious about money. I mean, um, you can also tell some finance teams aren't very serious about money. And so you want to make sure that you're working with companies that are, and that you're thinking about, and I love the way you guys said it. It's like, no, we're thinking about how can we make a generate a 3% EBITDA increase using AI, just like very specific. It's like, this is what we're trying to do. So I absolutely love that. I don't see any more questions. Well, you answered a few of them already that, that did get answered. So um, I guess with that, we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you, Gavra, so much for doing this. Really appreciate your time this morning. And thanks to everyone for joining. Thank you, everyone, for joining again. And Matt, thank you for having me today. Of course, it. of course. Good to see you. We'll see you again soon. Thank thanks, everyone. Bye.